So it has multiple states. And so right now, as I said, this is it's actually in an interactive state. And there are ultrasonic sensors around the, on the bottom layer that know that you're there. So I mean, you, you're, you're free to come closer if you want. And it, you know, if you do, you notice that sometimes it notices you uh, and you know, shows that it's happy when you, when you come closer. So it, it's based on distance. So if you, you know, walk farther away, then it'll, then it'll, you know, say, oh, where'd you go? And, um, and then it has times, like I said, when it's just completely ignoring you, and then it just does its own thing for, for a while. And so you never know, is it going to be happy to see you or just, you know, pretend like you're not there. Um, it can be frustrating because once you start to play with it and it's fun to interact with, then it'll just go like turn on you like that. Um, and so right now, and, and it gets tired too, like all these people, it's a little shy. And so it's taking a little rest right now and like sort of gathering its thoughts. Um, but while it's doing that, I might say that in some ways, by some definitions, it's a robot in the sense that the simplest de definition of a robot, something with a sensor, and something with an actuator, something that moves. And so as I mentioned, there's, there's 14 sensors along the bottom row. You can, you can actually see them. Um, they're right there. Uh, so all along the bottom, that's where the sensors are located. And they're sending out ultrasonic waves and then measuring how long does it take for the echo to return. And then based on that, they know how far away you are. Um, hey. Uh, <laughs> But it's also because it involves something hitting against another thing and making sound, it's also a percussion instrument, which is um, one of the, the first inspirations for this was um, actually the sound of roof hitting, uh, not the sound of roof hitting rain, the sound of rain hitting my roof. Um, and also the sound of when at the ocean when waves come in and then they go back out across a bunch of pebbles and so I worked with a lot of different materials to try to find sounds that were reminiscent of, of those things that were at the you know, inspiration. So right now it's just doing, it goes through a thing. And by the way, these coils are getting subjected to a lot, a lot of stress. Sometimes they shake really pretty intensely. Right now they're just, you know, like warming up. Um, and because of that, sometimes they fly off. So you might see a dramatic event happen. It's actually kind of, it's not that dramatic, but I could shake them less and then they wouldn't fall off. But you know, I've kind of come to accept this. This is part of the, uh, the noise aspect and the, you know, letting go of being the order Muppet. This is the chaos Muppet. Sometimes this thing that took a lot of effort to construct actually falls apart. And so during the last week that it's here, which is uh, this closes July 14th, we're going to turn it up and let it rip really hard. We're just going to like shake the living daylights out of it. So until then, I'm trying to, uh, you know, conserve a little bit. So, so it has a more gentle feeling for the most part. But sometimes it still gets going really, really pretty hard. So if you're here by yourself, sometimes um, it's you know, you could, just li you could just close your eyes and listen to it, and it's actually made for that also. Um, so, I, you know, it's a kind of kinetic sculpture slash robot slash piece of sound art. And then it's also a light installation, too. Um, the lights that are coming from both directions, because of all these tubes, which um, with my wife and one of my, I would say, my primary collaborator, we glued these, um, well, you, you, you saw a quick shot. Um, we glued them on one by one in our house, in our small house, and um, there's about 20,000 of them, and then we nailed them up here. The, the museum staff nailed it up, and then we came in with a cherry picker and glued up all the seams. Um, so the, the idea with the lights is because the um, tubes have all these different heights, then the shadow, depending, sometimes the lights aren't doing the same color, and it's actually easier to see from the other side of the, like from farther back, you can see how sometimes the shadows 
are one color and sometimes the other color because they're being blocked by the, the different heights of the tube. So that's another thing that's part of the design is how the light um, hits it. So I was going to talk a little bit about each project here, but while I'm on this one, does anybody have any questions or yes? What other materials did you play with and, and how is it that this ended up solving the problem? So the question is what other materials did I play with? And the answer is what didn't I play with? I tried so many, so many different things. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to get was this kind of biological cell-like surface. And so once I made that decision, a lot of things don't work because if you do chain, then it gets caught and stuck in there like immediately. So it actually has to be something that's capable of both hitting, but at the same time, um, not getting caught in there, yeah. So it was, I went to Home Depot as I was searching for things and I saw all this PVC stacked and it was like, that's it. <laughs> and so then I came home and we sawed, sawed it, cut it, put it on there and started hitting it with things. And then through a long process of experimentation, finally came to a sound that mm. worked with these motors too, because the motors actually make a fair amount of sound. And so it had to be lightweight, but make a lot of sound too. And so, this, the, this is actually book binding coil for if you have a really thick document. It's two inch diameter book binding coil. So. Any plans for it to be installed anywhere else? Um, Any there, there? Yeah, there's there, a couple of people have, have inquired about it informally, but there's no plans for a home yet besides a storage space probably at the moment because it's not going to come back to our house. <laughs> <laughs> Part, part, the seams will be. You can see kind of, um, trying to find, if you look really closely, you can, there's, there's edges along here. Like that's one panel, there's 70 panels. And so along the edges, we'll have to hit those off. But it's, it's pretty easy to, to get them back on. So it won't be terribly destroyed. The angle was purely a function of the sound. Well, actually, I should say the size of this piece was determined by the architecture of this space. So I knew that this piece was going to happen in here, and then I knew it was going to be along this wall. And so basically I tried to balance it with the size of this wall, but then also the height. And so the only thing that was changed there is as I experimented with making sound, if it was vertically hanging, then the coils don't hit against it, they have to be resting at a slight angle. Too much, Too much then, then they get stuck and can't move. So it was through a process of experimentation that I came up with that 15 degree rake, which is what it is. And then the brilliant preparators at this beautiful museum, uh, Pedro Ciceras in particular, came back. I, all I said to him was, I've got these 70 panels and this is what the whole thing would look like with 70 panels. And he came back with these incredibly elaborate, well, super sound design for how the whole structure of this, because this is literally a ton of weight that's, that's being supported. So um, it was my good fortune that the staff uh, is so extraordinary here that they were able to handle a project of this magnitude. And actually in the back room, there's another, actually an even larger construction project that was was part of this show too so they managed both of those in a in a fairly brief period of time i was really impressed so by that it's not being triggered by our interaction with us and yeah us. what's triggering the, the quails so sometimes they see a ghost sometimes they think that there's somebody there and it's because of the electrical noise and okay. so forth so occasionally that happens like right now well, those are pretty good. Like they're, they're actually, we're only going because somebody was close to them. So, so right now, responding? yeah, right now it's only respond. Like, um, it's only, you know, you saw like it's not going, but then I went closer yeah. and it did. So that's because that's the kind of mood it's in right now. But then other times it just, basically they're just passing messages back and forth to each other when they're ignoring you. And it's by monitoring the behavior of their neighbors mm -hmm. that they determine how to behave. 
there's so there's no, there's no internal well there's programming internal. internal to each one but right. not an overall thing controlling the whole piece yeah that's that's part of the the, the metaphor with the the little robots going into the, the rescue they just know how to talk to each other but they don't really care exactly what's going on all the way over there just like when birds are trying to follow a trajectory they follow their neighbors and it's out of each neighbor following its neighbor that this overall structure emerges so each, each is connected uh, just to, to neighbors not just to its neighbors yep yeah. Well, it's symmetrical partially because to accommodate, I mean, I could have, if I started um, changing, like if this was here, but I put it over there and so forth, then it starts to get difficult to have room for the coils to swing because they, they swing pretty far sometimes. Uh, so that was one consideration. And the other is that because the coils themselves, um, due to their springy nature, deform into all sorts of different shapes it felt like it's easier to appreciate that when it is just a, a perfectly regular grid to start with. So it could have, you know, there's probably other versions of this that could happily be asymmetrical, but those were some of the factors. Did you want it to be like that black diagram that you showed with all, you wanted to well, look like that? And, that, and that's, part of, that's part of the other thing is that, you know, again, starting from this very ordered state allowing it to drift into, you know, get pulled towards disorder in some way, but then never so far that you lose track of at least the outlines of the order that you started with. And so the grid is kind of a metaphor for that as well. So how did you connect with Nicholas Carell? Nicholas Carell, um, it's funny because our kids go to, went to the same school, and my wife had been telling me for like a year, there's this really interesting guy who does robotics at CU. You have to talk to each other. And I, you know, I kept saying, yeah, you're right. That would be great. Um, but then a colleague of mine said, there's this guy you should really talk to, Nicholas. And then I went and talked to him. And I came home and I said, Jane, I met this amazing guy, Nicholas <laughs> Carell. She said, you dumb, dumb. That's who I've been telling you to talk to for this whole time. And so I showed him this video sketch that I, that I showed in the presentation. And he said, oh, I want to I want to build that with you. And because it, it went with exactly the kind of research that he's doing. And one of the things that I didn't get to mention is that his research got put, the science of his research got pushed along through having to build something like this because most of the time when you're doing robotics research, you, you build a little model of something, you let it run for a couple minutes, you take a picture of it, and you write a paper, and that's that. This is this big structure that has to run for a month. And so it's really pushing the boundaries of what is commonly done in, a, in that kind of a computer science environment. It's helping the, develop the technology into a more robust state. So I was very gratified that there was that side benefit as well, too, of, of pushing the science along a bit. So I, I had wanted to um, set up, this is still, you know, all kind of a complex situation. I had wanted to have the drawing machine going. I, I will set it up if there are people still here. Um, but basically, so all of these drawings that are uh, on the wall there came out of that process that I, that I was telling you about. And so I'll just really quickly mention um, a few different types of them. So if you have a chance to look at them. There, there's five different kinds, and this is the one that I showed you that has the grid originally, and so you're just taking this grid and stretching it, adding noise, and you're pulling it and pushing it, and, and you get that. Here I started with a series of a very limited set of marks that were actually inspired by the drawings of Van Gogh, and I studied um, what, where, what are these textures that I really love and how are they put together. And so the thing that you see here is just ellipses or arcs that are stretched in various ways. And so if you're in this region, you know, if you come closer, you can see that there's a very clear patterning that happens. And so this region is all in, well, in one particular orientation. This is all in another orientation. And, and again, this process stretches on indefinitely 
in, in all directions, really. And so the, the, the kind of technique is basically like wandering in a landscape of this process with a camera and then just choosing, you know, where am I going to put the frame on this infinite process? And so why did I choose the frame there? It just seemed interesting to me, just for aesthetic reasons. So that's that one. This I talked about in the talk. It's the three-dimensional. It's like a piece of fabric that you just push in three dimensions. And then if you project it through a pinhole onto a surface in two dimensions, that's how you get that. I'm a big fan of pinhole photography. So that was part of that. This is another one of those kind that I talked about. This is the only one that has actual physics equations in it. And what this is, is these are based on the simulation of fluids. And so if you had a bunch of particles suspended in a fluid like water, say if you had a bunch of sticks or something in water and you took a stick and you went whoosh, like that, then the places where it's larger are the places where the particles are moving faster and the places where it's small are the places where there's less motion and, and it's more minimal. And here again, I just chose to make them ellipses. They could have been any kind of shape, but I just chose ellipses because that seemed interesting to me. So this is the only one that's actually using physics equations. Um, and then finally, there's, there's, there's one other kind. I don't know, people have referred to these as like pods exploding or something. And this is also, the way that I make these is there's a bunch of virtual particles that are kind of all following each other around and chasing after each other, sort of like swarming. And so I'm running that on my computer and this whole swarming thing is happening. And then when there's a moment that I like, I hit the space bar and I save that and then I can go have the machine draw that for me, that, that moment that I saved. So I'm basically just watching it, watching it, watching it. Oh, I like that. And then I save that. And you know, sometimes I miss it and it's gone forever. So it's a real-time process that I'm trying to just capture a snap. So this is basically a snapshot out of a process that happens in time. So there are a bunch of other kinds of processes that I've been experimenting with that aren't, aren't here yet, but um, those are the five main ones that are um, going on with that. And then any questions about these before I go to some of the other things? There's five videos here. The central one is, it, is, is from a different series. So the, the, that, the other four come from the same series, uh, which is called Why Time. Um, it's kind of a reference to, to uh, one of my favorite composers, uh, Morton Feldman, has a piece called Why Patterns. And so the, these are called Why Time, and then the central one is called Why Color. Um, but basically, these are, taking one very, very simple idea that again goes on forever, like the process in the drawings. It's, it's in motion, I chose, instead of a frame in space, I chose a frame in time, where to stop it. But each one is a very slowly unfolding event, and it's just one event that just, I, I happen to you know, drop in on and, and take, a, take a video of, as it were. It's a virtual event, so this is just, I modeled with that software that I showed you essentially a transparent tube that has its perfect form disturbed by a sort of sheen of noise, which you can see on the edges there. So otherwise it would have been just a, a perfect tube. And then through that I'm shooting these colored lights that are slowly changing their orientation, slowly changing their colors in various types of cycles that just do their own thing for a while. This one is actually, there's a sphere that's very slowly rotating. And again, a bunch of different colors, depending on the angle that the sphere is pointing, uh, come up, it's, it's a Fresnel effect. But this too has a coating of noise that I find interesting to look at. I guess that's why I put it there. Um, but it's, there's a lot, a lot of details in, in the noise. So part of the idea is that with these um, videos is that you could, out of the corner of your eye, you know, see them in a gallery, <coughs> and hopefully the color is interesting enough or the form or whatever it is to feel like, oh yeah, there's something over there. But if you come over and look at them, even though they're moving very, very slowly for the most part, except for that one, um, 
there's, they reward your paying attention to them because you, you see things unfolding over time. So if you have a chance to, to spend a moment with, with any of them, hopefully that moment is rewarded by seeing something, something happening there. Um, this one, I was attempting to make a, a, a piece that's based um, in part on my love for experimental filmmakers like Stan Brakhage. Um, even though it doesn't look anything like his work, he's been he's a very strong influence on me and um, someone I knew a little bit while he taught here at CU, just a legend of, of Boulder. Um, and so it was really my first introduction to non-narrative, colorful abstraction in moving images. So that's uh, where that one comes from. And then those are just more, more similar processes of what I already described. I've gone back and forth between um, videos that give you a lot more information to look at and are changing really quickly and they cut from this scene to that scene and so forth. And as you'll see in this next room, I'm actually personally very drawn to uh, contemplative forms of experience, which is different from the way, you know, most, mostly with our culture, you turn on the television and you know you you want to find out in five seconds what that thing is and they want to tell you in five seconds why you should buy the product and the kinds of experiences that i you know i i could sit and watch the clouds roll across the sky for like three hours and be happier than you know a clam and so um these videos i think re reflect my interest in sitting still with a process and just letting it unfold so the process, I mean, I think when you say process, that is sort of the key component to this, is that there is a slowly unfolding process. So what, whether it's more important, I'm not sure, but it's definitely very important to me. This is another space that I think of as a fairly contemplative space in that, um, this is also a very slowly unfolding process. Um, and so sometimes the light, actually right now, the light is relative to what the possible levels of intensity could be is actually fairly low. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you that this is approximately 10% of the overall brightness that there could be. So there are times when you come in here when it might be doing this for quite some time. And that would be your entire, if you came in here for say, um, Oh, wait a second. What time is it? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. If you were, yeah, they're on a timer. Um, if you were to um, come in here and spend like say one minute, this might be your entire experience. You might see just this color. Um, whereas if you came back another time or if you sat here for some time, period of time, then you would see it go from these, these very, you know, much dimmer colors to really bright. So if, if that's about 10%, you know, sometimes it's 100% and it's really, really bright. Um, and sometimes there's a process, let me see if this is one of those times. Yeah, so this actually is one of those times where this is one of those things. It's like, I guess, growing up again in the 70s with the, the Heinz ketchup bottle and there's a song about the, anticipation there's a color that's very slowly making its way across if i'm if i am not mistaken you see how over in the left there that's that's not the same color as we have over here so there's a process where this is very slowly going to make its way all the way across the room over time and there might be there's other things where it might start sort of in the center here and then radiate out this way again over a very you know long period of time so if you want to get that experience it demands patience you know if you just came in here and looked for like five seconds then i don't think you would you would have the same experience that i was imagining uh, and why i wanted to why i wanted to build this and see this myself why i wanted to come sit here because i wanted to just be, you know, alone with light and with the motion um, in time and space of these, you know, gently swaying what turns out, I don't know if it's, if it's wrecking the illusion to tell you what it is back there, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't, but 
there's, there's a bride somewhere who's in tears right now <laughs> because there's 750 yards of bridal tool suspended from, from, from cables. And you actually, um, you can't, a lot of people can't tell, um, but there's a scrim that's suspended here too that's diffusing the light also. And if you look at it from a steep angle, uh, it goes translucent. Um, so that's another component. And then there's um, six channels of sound, and those are um, all displaying um, variations of the musical notes C, A, G, E, which is um, after the composer John Cage, who is also a really huge influence on me, um, and someone that I was lucky enough to have a, to work with very briefly uh, when I was a student in Boston. And um, again, going with this whole thing about noise and so forth, the actual source of the musical tones is noise. It's pink noise, which is being filtered. So if, if it were unfiltered, then it would just be like, <laughs> like that. Well, it would sound maybe a little better than that, but basically that's what you would hear, but it's being filtered so that all of the other parts of that, except for that particular tone, a C, an A, or a G, or an E, are getting pulled away. So it's like a piece of uh, marble or something that you're chopping away at until the thing that you want remains. However, the amount of noise that's allowed to, to remain in the sound is constantly changing. It's actually randomly changing, and so this sound doesn't ever repeat. It just goes on and on forever. And so if you listen to it again, sort of, you know, sitting by yourself here, you, and you hear slowly individual notes come in, like, I don't know, maybe it takes 40 or 50 seconds for one note to come up. And you'll hear during that whole span of time that it'll travel from being a very, very pure tone uh, to something that has a lot more kind of turbulence in it. And then so it'll be much more sort of like the wind or like some kind of, you know, the wind in a stairwell or something like that. And then other times it's much more focused like a whistle or, or, or like a flute. And that's just a, another process. So there's a computer back in the hallway there that is working very hard to uh, spin out all of these notes endlessly. So that's kind of the story of that one. That's a great question. I've, I'm sort of a musician in search of an instrument, I feel like, because I play, I'm a serial dabbler of instruments. Whenever I get, um, you know, to a reasonable level at one, I start doing another one. So when I was growing up, I played mostly piano, and I still play piano. And then I also played guitar, like jazz and classical and rock guitar very seriously, um, and performed a lot as a musician, and still perform as a musician, um, mostly on electric guitar, but I also play different percussion instruments and the musical saw. And uh, I do play the musical saw and the bones and different stuff. So I'm, a, and I'm learning trombone with my son now. So I might do that in public at some point. But yeah, I'm, I'm a serial dabbler of music, which is why I became a composer, partially, because um, my interest is, is in how all the instruments work and the ways that you put them together. So, yes. The lights are actually going through a sequence of program decisions. So I was going to do the same process that's driving the sound with the lights. And um, at the time, this, let's see, how do I explain it? So putting all of this together was actually a really big job. And I was trying to minimize the number of computers that were involved just to minimize the chaos factor because that was the order Muppet in me. So it turned out to be much easier to just have a series of decisions that were made in advance about the lights that are left to go on their own cycle and, and the music just floats on top of that. So actually there's another box in the hallway there that's driving the lights for this room and then there's a cable, they're all chained together through the ceiling out to there. So actually all three sets of lights are getting driven by the same box which is also working pretty hard out there. Yeah, the thing about these, these lights are all um, LED lights, and so they're, they're definitely the future, I think, LED lights, because they don't really get hot. With, with traditionally incandescent lights, about 
is radiated out as heat, not as light. And with LEDs, it's, it's the opposite. And so these can just run and run and run and run and run. And then instead of putting colored gels over them, you just have a series of different, each, each one of these lights has a red, green, blue, and a white component. And so you're able to just with the same light change which color it's displaying. So there's many, 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 many different colors that you can create from one light. So there's about, um, let's see, there's about 18 of them between these two spaces. So. Michelle Ellsworth, my friend and colleague, said, you know, you really need to have dancers. Well, it would be nice to have dancers coming through. And so as we were installing this, we experimented with people um, it's actually a really cool, if it were easy for me to go in there, I would show you how cool it looks to have people standing in there, but it really looks cool. So that's um, a thought for another project, is with all this 750 yards of uh, bridal tool and all these lights, do a performance somewhere. There's a whole ton of fans back there, and so it's super low tech. Uh, I needed something to be low tech, and so the fans my wife and I went to, Vari to Target and McGuckins and so forth. And we tried to find which fans had different oscillating periods so that they wouldn't all wind, wind up in sync. And so you see, again, it was the whole kind of thing because I like the idea of the orderliness of going like this, but then I like something pushing against it so that you get the remnants of, I mean, you can see you can see how this one, every now and then, it goes this way, and then it goes that way, but then there's fans pointing from two directions. There's a whole line of fans along the front here, but then there's also a line in the back. And so that's, that's tending to make them kind of swirl around as well, too. And the fact that they were different brands and manufacturers gave, makes them constantly out of sync with each other. So Well, so, I mean, all of the pieces in this show basically had their genesis in a very small room in my house where I experimented with materials endlessly. And so for this piece, um, we strung up tension wire across our ceiling, which our kids love, and we hung all sorts of different, I just got, I had LED lights, and then I got tons and tons of different kinds of fabrics. I went back to the store over and over again to find the thing that could have this flowing quality and that was you know had this kind of transparency but that also would reflect light really strongly and that had a kind of glow to it and then to find this material also I just started putting things in front of it until I found so it was really just a process of trial and error on a very small scale imagining in my mind always this space and these two different chambers originally actually this piece was going to be two gigantic acrylic domes that were glowing in different cycles and it turned out that to do just one of those was going to cost three hundred thousand dollars so you know some some other time uh, <laughs> but the two the having two oscillating chambers still remained as part of the idea and then it just became actual glowing chambers rather than glowing balls so, and then, you know, again, I set up a bunch of fans in my house. I just set this all up on a scale that was something like from here to there was what I was working with and trying to guess what it would feel like once you put it here. And then it wasn't until we actually installed this here in the space and then got to, you know, figure out how much fabric to really put, how many fans do we really need? It was a period of just experimenting in the actual installation process to really get you know this look yeah so the whole show we installed during work weeks um a pro almost four full weeks you know my monday through saturday yeah. so but this was an incredible one of the things that i wish you could see is what an incredible construction feat this was for the people in the museum here because this is actually normally empty space right here and there as well too and so they had to fly a truss a, a load-bearing truss across the ceiling uh, in both both at that angle and well two of them one at that angle which is really far you know it's 35 feet and then they discovered because it's a new space they discovered that the plans weren't fully telling the truth about the structure where they were going to mount it and so 
they went up in the ceiling and put more structure in so that they could do this. So it was actually like an incre incredibly dramatic kind of process to, to build this. And then their workmanship, the way that they finished all of these surfaces is just absolutely, I'm, I'm mind boggled by the quality of their work here in this museum. It's really extraordinary. The scrim is actually a polyester and it's, um, you can get it from a theatrical supply. I got it from Rose Brand and they sell all sorts of different kinds of theatrical things. One of the things that I, yeah, it's stretched. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that I wanted to do originally that I didn't do, which is really cool with this material, is that if you shine light from the front, then it goes, um, it goes opaque. So if you're shining strong lights from the front, you can play with sort of seamlessly making it go transparent and go opaque. But once it got set up, it just felt complete by itself and there wasn't really a need to, to play with that. But that's a cool property of the material that is fun to play with. All right, well, thank you, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot.